الله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنة إلى يوم الدين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome back uh, brothers and sisters um, to the next segment or next session of uh, the day of judgment which is like part uh, three of the final journey workshop or the final journey series um, and uh, Again, just to remind everyone that we are starting at 4.15 p.m. KSA time. I think many of the brothers and sisters are not aware of this time. Um, we've covered quite a bit, alhamdulillah. Uh, I think this is the fourth session or fifth session. Uh, fourth, fifth session, I think. It's fifth session for the Day of Judgment itself. And we still have uh, quite a bit to cover, inshallah. Uh, because this is a day, like we said, the Day of Judgment is equivalent to 50,000 years of our time. So, uh, you know, in, in, in the human uh, time periods, uh, it's one day equivalent to 50,000 years. So there's a lot of things happening, a lot of action happening, a lot of uh, so, um, activities, uh, situations, circumstances going on. And we covered quite a few. We talked about uh, the various names of the Day of Judgment. We looked at how people will die uh, or soon away at, at the blowing of the trumpet. And we also then looked at the resurrection uh, which is number three there, and people will be resurrected. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the brothers um, he had a question on on the age. Uh, I think a couple of sessions back of of people when they will be resurrected, right? Uh, I already answered it on the um, lectures uh, group in, in, on Telegram, uh, but I'm not sure if he is part of that group. Um, so if he's listening, if the brother is listening, I'm not. I don't remember his name either. I'm sorry, but if he's listening. Uh, we'll just repeat it again. So, um, people will be resurrected at the age at which they die. In terms of resurrection, al bath yeah, when the graves open up and people come back, uh, we grow back, you know, from the rain which falls from the heavens, as we discussed, from the coccyx bone, the tailbone, they will uh, come back alive or be resurrected at the age at which they die. So, an infant which dies at uh, two weeks of age after being born at the time of resurrection he or she will be two weeks a person who dies at the age of 100 at the time of resurrection his age will be 100 his age will be 100 but the age of entering jannah and nar is different there's something else the ages will change again we'll look at that inshallah when we talk, when we talk about uh, part four the final part of jannah and nar we'll look at the ages of the people uh, when they enter jannah and nar that will be a standard age for everybody, 33 years, standard. Be it an infant who died or a person who died at 100 years old, he will enter Jannah, inshallah, at the age of 33 years old and at the height of uh, 60 cubits. So uh, this is different from the resurrection. So they're two different aspects, two different um, things in terms of the ages, right? But that was just to answer the question which was there a couple of weeks back. It's already answered with the evidences in the lectures group. We also looked at gathering. We looked at how people will be gathered. Al-Hashr, uh, the, the earth will be replaced with a different earth and so on. We talked about that. We talked about the horrors of the Day of Judgment, uh, the situation of the sun, the moon, the heavens, the stars, the earth itself, and the, um, and the mountains. Uh, we are currently in the state of the people. We're currently in number six of the agenda, which is the situation of various types of people on the Day of Judgment. And various discussions, arguments, uh, conversations which happen in the future in the Day of Judgment. And we know of this through the revelation, Wahi, the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? We already looked at the first two aspects of this, which is the state of the Kafir people, uh, the Kuffar rather, the Kuffar, uh, and how they will blame each other, they will blame their idols, they will blame their gods, um, and so on. Yeah? We also looked at the disputes between the people of Nar, the Hellfire and how they will argue with each other, right? Uh, we are, we looked yesterday at, at the believers who sin, because see, in terms of Islam, right? Uh, if you talk to uh, a Kafir or someone from the West, he will tell you people are like civilians, uh, military, huh? uh, and stuff like this. But in Islam, it's simple and easy, very easy. We don't, we don't follow the categories from the West. Islam is defined for us how people are categorized. All with taqwa, with taqwa in mind and from the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How? We have the mu'min, 
the believers. We have the kuffar, the kafir, the disbelievers, the rejections, people who have rejected uh, faith and rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we have uh, the munafiq, the munafikun, the hypocrites, people who show Islam outwardly, but in their hearts, they hate Islam. They have kufr in their hearts. But outwardly, they show Islam. So they're in fact more dangerous than the kafir. The munafiq is more dangerous than the kafir. Because the kafir we know, John Doe, uh, Sally Mom, whatever. We know, we know the name, we know he's a kafir. Usually, yeah, uh, largely. Of course, an exception, but largely because sometimes a Muslim is revert from, from uh, his revert and then he must keep on his, his um, previous name. It's possible as long as it doesn't involve kufr. But usually we know by the name and by the look and, and appearance that the person is a kafir. And we treat him as such. But the munafiq, he prays with us. In the first row, in the first saf in, in Jama'ah, he fasts with us. But in his heart, he hates Islam. So he's more dangerous than the kafir. And he's very pleased with the downfall of Islam and very unpleased, displeased with the rise of Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala defined us these three categories in the initial parts of Surah Baqarah. Surah Baqarah. We also have a chapter, Surah Munafiqun, in the, in the Quran. Surah Mu'minun, we have. Yeah? But these three categories are defined to a large extent in the initial, uh, the first page, or the first and second page of Surah Baqarah, the second uh, Surah. So, uh, in Islam, it is the Kafir, the Munafiq, and uh, the Mu'min. So, we also started looking yesterday at the believers who have sinned, the Mu'min, the Muslims, but they have committed various sins. And we looked at various punishments for these and so on and so forth. We also looked at the purification process, that all this is part of the purification of the sins, uh, or the wiping away of the sins, inshallah, of the moment. It is not a guarantee. Like we said, there is a condition. It is not a guarantee. The condition is what? That we have patience. We have sabr through these trials, these challenges, these sicknesses, loss of wealth, loss of family members, loss of uh, uh, body parts. We have, we bear this through patience. That's the condition. For the purification, otherwise it is not purified. There is no. You may have a, uh, you may break an arm, but then if you curse yourself and say, "Why did Allah do this to me?" Subhanallah, there is no purification, zero purification. Your sins still remain. The condition is that we have patience, sabr. So we looked at this as, as well yesterday. Just a quick recap. And we looked at the various uh, kind of punishments described in the Quran and the Sunnah on the day of judgment for believers who commit these kind of sins. Number one, we talked about people who do not pay zakah. And we talked about the, 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 the kibr or, or the arrogance of, of Muslims and how that will go punished. And we'll say they will be in the form of ants uh, walking around, being trampled by the people running around on the Day of Judgment. We also looked at various categories, a lot of categories of people, most Muslims again, whom Allah will not look at or purify them. SubhanAllah. And we ask Allah to save us from these categories. Look at very various of these categories, people, uh, you know, the old man who commits zina, uh, people who do isbal, leave their garment uh, below the ankles, uh, various categories. We looked at all of this yesterday, alhamdulillah. Uh, if you missed it, you can look at the video, inshallah. And I apologize for yesterday, there was a breakup in the video of my screen sharing in the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, I, I somehow, I think I stopped it. Madri, I don't know what happened. Uh, I apologize for that. But the audio was there. Uh, just that the slides were not visible for the last 10 minutes. Uh, well, I'll we also looked at people who spend to luxurize, luxurize themselves, yeah, to 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 uh, live the lives of the rich and famous, yeah. Uh, and Subhanallah, this is uh, you know, like we like we say, we we try to be whom we we look at, you know, we covet what we see around us. So all these uh, shows of the lifestyles of the rich and famous, the Hollywood stars, Bollywood stars, um, uh, singers, pop stars, what have you. Yeah, these are propagated, these are blown out of proportion, these are marketed, these are sold they are through marketing campaigns, ad campaigns, you know, all the while wanting people to be like them. So their, their businesses can run, uh, you know, the, the Max and the Max Factors and the Nikes, they can sell their products. That's why these are done. Yeah, the cars and so on and so forth. Uh, so this, this uh, Muslim should be, should be aware of, you should be aware of this. Uh, he should be a wise person. A Muslim is not a fool. A Muslim is a wise person. And he's a strong person as per the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa So living in the lap of luxury, um, this is, was another category we discussed. Again, to say that it's nothing wrong in being rich. Because this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
but how do you obtain the wealth and how do you spend it? That's the point. You also look at the betrayal, the one, the one who betrays Muslims, he will have a banner on the Day of Judgment saying betrayal. So people will be able to identify that Fala is a betrayer. Fala is a betrayer. A very humiliating and embarrassing situation to be in. Uh, also, the people who steal, steal from the Ghanima, steal from, and we talked about, um, uh, you know, office atmospheres, uh, uh, public servants, civil servants, people who steal uh, wealth uh, from, from uh, others, even in family uh, scenarios and so on and so forth. Grabbing lands by force, we looked at uh, the two faced Muslim. He will also, how, how he will be punished on the Day of Judgment. He will have a tongue with his fork. Uh, we looked at also people who beg and ask of people in spite of being sufficient. And we define in a couple of a hadith, a hadith, what is sufficiency? What is something which is enough for a Muslim? We discussed this also yesterday, alhamdulillah. Uh, and finally, I think we talked about lying about dreams that are specifically mentioned in, in the Sharia. That people, you know, they say, okay, in the morning I saw this dream, when actually he didn't see a dream. Or he say, I saw, I don't know, Rasulullah in the dream, Billah, or something else, when it didn't, did not happen that way. And eavesdropping. Uh, people who listen upon conversations, who like to know what's happening. Uh, you know, see, a Muslim, a Muslim is supposed to keep to himself. A Muslim, largely, of course, largely, unless he sees something wrong, a zulm happening, there's something else. Oppression, yeah, he needs to stop it, there's something else. But generally speaking, you do not interfere in matters which do not concern you. This is, this is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa But we want to know about everything as Muslims. Okay, we want to know what my colleague did, what the manager did, what my uh, families do, what my neighbors do. But it doesn't bother us. And nobody is asking you for it. So a Muslim should keep to himself. So this kind of eavesdropping, even looking into others' houses, this comes under the same category. It is, it is haram, it is not allowed to look into other people's houses. Rasulullah said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the hadith meaning of which is, it is better that your eyes are pierced, taken out, rather than that you look at somebody into somebody else's house. So Islam protects privacy. Islam is protective of privacy. In many parts of the region, you know, uh, especially in some parts of the Gulf, you'll see the houses of the local population, they have these huge walls around them because they want to protect their privacy. So it's not good as you're walking down the road to look here and there, look into the balconies, look into the houses. This is not allowed in Islam. It all comes into the same category of eavesdropping and there are stipulated punishments for it on the Day of Judgment. Time. Um, so uh, we are in the last section of the state of the people on the Day of Judgment. And these uh, are, we're going to talk about are the, the pious people, the people who are taqwa, the mu'min. What is their condition on the Day of Judgment? So we saw the believers who committed sins. Now we're going to look at the believers, the mu'min, who do not sin, or, who, who, or whose sins are already wiped off, purified, before they enter the Day of Judgment. The pious will not be terrified. This is one of the many rewards for a person who lives his life, he or she, uh, following the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and keeping away from the prohibitions mentioned in Sharia. See, in Islam, uh, because this, this lecture is in the English language, uh, but in the Arabic language, when a male is mentioned in the Quran or in the Hadith, when it talks about a man, it automatically includes the woman. This is the way Arabic language is structured. It is not something specific to the Quran or the Sunnah. It is how Arabic is structured. Uh, if you go talk to a Christian, a Christian Arab who is from the Arab countries, I don't know, Egypt or wherever, um, Yemen, Morocco, wherever, and you ask him this, he will agree. He knows this because this is how Arabic is. This, this is the, uh, one of the characteristics of the language. When a man is mentioned, it includes the woman. However, in the Quran and the Sunnah, as you may have encountered yourselves as well, in some areas, Allah specifically mentions the Muslimat, the, 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 the females, specifically, to lay emphasis, to emphasize uh, the, the Mu'min and the Mu'minat, Muslim and the Muslimat, it is mentioned in various ayat. But generally, otherwise, generally speaking, uh, when, when the, the Muslim is mentioned, uh, the Mu'min is mentioned, it includes the Mu'minat. This is, this is understood. Barakallahu feekum, I hope it's clear. But when I'm speaking in English, I, I may use man. It doesn't mean I'm talking only about men, right? I just want to clarify that. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm, only, I'm, only, I'm only talking about the man. I'm also referring, you know, to the... Uh, 
to the women, to the sisters, type right? Jazakallah khair. So the pious male or female will not be terrified on the day of the Jummah. Because of their piety. Surah Anbiya, Allah says, meaning of which is, verily those for whom the good has proceeded from us, they will be removed far there from, from where? From hell. They shall not hear the slightest sound of it while they abide in that which their own selves desire. The greatest terror will not grieve them. And the angels will meet them with their greeting. This is your day which you were promised. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And we ask Allah to make us from this category. Amen. So what do we learn from this ayah in Surah Anbiya? That the mu'min, the pious people, the Muslims who are pious and who believe in Allah and His Messenger and follow the commandments strictly, they shall not even hear the slightest sound of hell. And hell, bear in mind, is a fire raging, ferocious, burning right through. This will cause a sound. A huge roaring sound. But the pious will be way away from it. As we will discuss in, in the past, last part, Jannah and Nar, we'll talk more about this inshallah. But the pious people will be removed far from it. They cannot even hear the sound of hell burning. This fire burning. You know, you go to the you go you go to the forest, for example, or the desert, and you start a bonfire. Many of you must have done that. You know, bonfire, you get some pieces of uh, dry wood, or you try to make a barbecue. Huh? Uh, get a small fire burning. It's a small fire, a teeny mini fire compared to the fire of hell. You still hear the sound of the burning, the 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 the, the wood cracking, uh, the, the, um, the the you know the barbecue burning. You can't hear a sound. And all of us have have uh, heard this. Imagine the fire of hell, huge, humongous, and burning with so many people inside it, and idols. And the pious will be will not even hear the slightest sound of it. And the greatest terror, all these horrors we talked about on the Day of Judgment, the horrors of the sun, moon, the heavens splitting, the, 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 the seas bursting forth. Huh? These horrors, these terrors will not grieve the pious people. When they are resurrected, they will be greeted by the angels. The angels will greet them with smiling faces and they will tell them, this is your day which you were promised. Allah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, Alladina amanu bi ayatina wa kanu muslimin. It will be said to the believers, the mu'min, my worshippers, Ya Ibadi, no fear shall be on you this day, nor shall you grieve. Al yawma wala antum tahzanun. Tahzanun is that you will not grieve. Wala, wala antum tahzanun, and you will not grieve. And this is Surah Zukhruf, who believed in our ayat. So this is the condition. See, everything in life has conditions. Everything in life has conditions. You want to get married, there are conditions to it. You want a job, you go for an interview, there are certain conditions you have to fulfill. You want a passport, there are certain conditions you have to fulfill. You want to enter a country, you want a visa, there are certain conditions you have to fulfill. Everything in life has conditions. Everything. Likewise, if you want this category, there are conditions who believed in our ayat, the proofs, the verses, the lessons, the signs, firmly believed and loved them without a shred of a doubt. And they were Muslims who submitted to the oneness or uniqueness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the better translation is uniqueness, not oneness. Right. Number two. So the first reward or the first characteristic is that they will be saved from the terror and horror on the Day of Judgment. The pious Muslims. What about number two? Remember we talked about that on the day of judgment, the sun will come down in one hadith, one bow or two bows height. In another hadith, a meal, a one mile height above us. All of us. You will all experience this. And we will be naked and uncircumcised. So there is no clothing to protect you from the heat of the sun. And we will be drenched drenched in our sweats because depending on the deeds and depending on our sins and we said the earth will be spread flat out as a different earth and there is no shade on it there is no parapet there is no building there is no umbrella there is no car there is no tree there is nothing we can take shade under except 
except except the shade of the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, he will come down and he will shade certain categories of people, certain select categories of people, certain specific Muslims, only Muslims. We're talking about Muslims here. The kuffar khalas, we are done with them. These are Muslims. He will shade them under his throne. Allah Akbar. Again, we ask Allah to be from these categories that we are shaded under the throne of Allah. And we need to try to achieve one of this, at least one of this category, if not more, to have to stand a chance to obtain the shade when, when the sun is so down that you'll be burning and everybody will be thirsty and there is no water to drink. Allah says, sorry, Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in Bukhari and Muslim, and this hadith is Sahih. There are seven whom Allah will shade with His shade on the day when there will be no shade except His. Number one, the just ruler. The young man who grows up worshipping his Rabb. The man whose heart is attached to the, to the masjid. Two men who love one another for the sake of Allah, meeting and parting for that reason. A man who is invited to sin by a woman of high status and beauty, but he says, I fear Allah. A man who gives in charity so secretly that his left hand does not know what his right hand gives. And a man who remembers Allah when he is alone and his eyes fill with tears. These are the seven select categories, specific, exclusive, honored categories whom Allah will shade with the shade of his throne on the day of judgment so that they are not affected by the sunlight or the heat of the sun. Again, who are these categories? Number one, the just ruler. The hadith talks about a ruler, but the, the muhadithun or the, the scholars of hadith and Islam, they say this applies to anybody who is in charge of something or someone. It could be uh, the just ruler, it could be the just um, treasurer, the one who is responsible for Baitul Mal. It could be the just father or the husband. It could be the just uh, CEO or manager if you have a team working under you. It's, it's the same. It applies to everybody. The key aspect here is justice. Are we just in what we do? Again, it's easy to say, Fala ruler is, is not just. Fala president is not just. Fala king is not just. But look into our own hearts. Are we just? Are we just with our families? Are we just between our wives? Are we just between our children? That's the point. And justice is something which is very sacred to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because he himself is al-adl, the most just. And he loves the people who, who do justice, even if it is against themselves. Even if it is against themselves. Your son has a fight with the neighbor's son. And the case comes to you. And the neighbor's son has torn your son's, son's shirt. Or he has scratched him and he's bleeding. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? Do you immediately reprimand your neighbor's son? Or do you listen to the argument and see that who's at fault? And if your son is at fault, what do you do again? If your own son was at fault, what do you do? Do you uh, protect him? Do you say, tell him, you, you, you tell him, forget it and ask, this, ask the neighbor's son to go back home? What do you do? That's justice. That's justice. You love your daughter more than your son. And these two have a fight. What do you do? Do you protect your daughter just because you love her more? Or do you make justice equally by looking at the case from both perspectives and deciding equally. Fatima radiallahu anha. Who's Fatima radiallahu anha? The daughter of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the Prophet of Allah. And his most beloved daughter. He loved her very much. What did he say in the hadith? He told, Ya Fatima, Ya Fatima, do good deeds. Because even I cannot help you on the day of judgment. Allahu Akbar. The father is telling the daughter. Not any father, not any daughter. The Prophet of Allah, the best of creation, is telling his most beloved daughter, Fatima, 
do good deeds, do righteous good deeds, because even I cannot help you on the day of judgment. Allah says. And we see this all across the Islamic societies or Muslim societies. Uh, a marriage breaks up. A marriage breaks up. And we are from, let's say, the girl's side. We are relatives of the girl and it broke up. So immediately, what do we do? We start backbiting, foul mouthing the husband without knowing what actually happened. It could have been the girl's fault. And no marriage breaks up just because one person is at fault. It's very, very rare and far between. They both have to work at it. But this is commonly seen. Or vice versa. We are from the boy's side. We immediately start blaming the girl. To the extent that she can never get married again. She shows she's totally humiliated. And the rumor spreads all across the society and the town and the city. Nobody wants to marry her again. Subhanallah. Is this justice? Is this justice? So to get the shade of Allah's throne on the day of judgment, we need to be just here, brothers and sisters. This advises to me first and then to all of us. Inshallah. Number two, the second category, the young man who grows up worshipping Allah. What does this mean? Why is Rasulullah uh, specifically, of course, uh, through a revelation, of course, specified young man, shabab, the youth. Because if you look around, again, the societies today, where are the youth? Where are the teenagers? Where are the, where are the early 20 years olds? Are they in the masajids? Are they in the first row in Salat al-Fajr? Where are they? They're sitting behind the PlayStation. They're sitting behind uh, smartphones. They're in movie theaters. They're dating girls. They're attending rock concerts. Subhanallah. So a person, a young man, who grows into Islam, and Allah, alhamdulillah, blesses him, he avoids all of this and sticks to worshipping Allah, this is his reward on the Day of Judgment. This is his reward on the Day of Judgment. Number three, the man whose heart is attached to the masjid. What does this mean? The man whose heart is attached to the masjid. Does this mean someone who's sitting in the masjid from Fajr to Isha? Khalas, he doesn't leave the masjid at all. Itikaf or right through the year, the whole year. Ra. Ra Sheikh. This means a person who loves a man who loves to pray in the masjid. Of course, this category specifically is for the men. Because for the sisters, as we know, the best salah for them, as per the hadith of Rasulullah is in her home and in the inner innermost parts of her home. The innermost chambers of her home. So a man who prays fajr in salah. Sorry, in, in, in the masjid, he prays Salat al-Fajr. Of course, he leaves after that. Or he sits for some time, zikr of, of the morning, alhamdulillah. This is good, alhamdulillah. And then once he leaves, he's immediately thinking, where will I be for Zuhur? Zuhur Salah, where can I pray? Will I be in at office? Taib. If I'm in the office, I can pray in the musalla, or I can pray in the masjid next to the office. Or if I'm traveling somewhere, I'm going for this meeting, is there a masjid close by? To the extent that he may also go to the Google Maps or whatever and search where is the closest masjid? Because he wants to play, pray Salat al-Fajr, Salat al-Dhuhr in the masjid in Jama'ah. He finishes Salat al-Dhuhr. Immediately he's thinking, where will I be for Asr? Where can I pray Asr? Which, which masjid? Will I be going back home? If I go back home, Alhamdulillah, I can pray in the masjid near my house. So this is what it means with a man whose heart is attached to the masjid. Salat al-Isha. Commonly missed by most of us. The wife says, okay, let's go shopping. Let's go to this mall. Let's go here. Let's go there. Let's go visiting. The Jazakallah khair. Salat al is coming. 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Let's finish it in the masjid and then we'll go. This is the man whose heart is attached to the masjid. Barakallah faykum. Number four. Two men who love one another for the sake of Allah. Yani this is an amazing feeling. You have to experience this. I cannot put it in. Whatever I say or whatever you read, it will not do it justice. You have to experience this love which Allah puts in the hearts of Muslims 
who are brothers for the sake of Allah. Need not be blood brothers. One could be a Chinese Muslim, one could be an, a Russian Muslim, one could be an American Muslim, one could be an Indian Muslim. It doesn't matter. They love each other for the sake of Allah. They, they like the other person, they, they treat him as a brother because he is a Muslim. And a practicing Muslim even more so. There is a hadith of this from the Rasulullah He talks about a khissa or, or, or a story from the past. He says there was a man in a town uh, who went on a journey. He was going on a journey. He left, he was walking towards another city or another town. Jibreel came to him in the form of a man. Jibreel came to him in the form of a man. And he stopped him on the way. And he asked him, where are you going? So he said, I'm going to this town. And he asked him, why are you going to this town? He said, I want to meet Falan person. Falan, Falan person, I want to meet this, this brother. So he said, is he your brother, blood brother? He said, no. So do you have any you know, trade dealings with him or you know, any, any uh, uh, buying, selling, any, 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 uh, any, any trade to be completed with him? He said, no. Do you owe any, any money or he owes you money, you want to go and give the money, collect the money back? No. I said, Manai, why are you going to meet him? Because he is my brother in Islam and I love him for the sake of Allah. And Jibreel tells him, because of your love for his brother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you Jannah. Given you entrance into Jannah. Allah. So you have a bonus here. Man. And this brothers and sisters, if, if, you, if you know what I'm saying, and if you, if you have uh, this kind of relationships with, with, with other brothers and sisters, of course, <laughs> here I mean brothers with brothers and sisters with sisters. Huh? Not, the, not the cross uh, between the non-Maharabs. No, definitely no. So a brother loving another uh, man, loving another man for the sake of Allah and a sister loving, loving another sister for the sake of Allah again. All are included in this category. Not the brother loving the sister, obviously. Yeah? So uh, this is something which we experience. We have to yani, experience it to understand it. And this is an amazing feeling. Wallahi, it's an amazing feeling. And the reward of this is as we saw, the shade of Allah's throne. Number five, a man who refuses a woman's advances. So a woman wants to seduce him. She wants to have her way with him. What would you and I do? What would most of us do? Fall, fall to it. In fact, here we have a condition where men are going out looking for women. And here we have a situation where the woman wants to have this man. And the man refuses. Why? Because he fears Allah. He fears falling into zina. He fears committing fornication. Who is the classical example of this from the Quran? Who? Yusuf alayhi salam. If you studied uh, or read uh, Surah Yusuf, you will know that the, the, the prime ministers, if you want to call him that, his wife uh, advanced on, on Yusuf alayhi salam. She wanted to have her way with him because he was very beautiful. Rasulullah said, Sallallahu alayhi salam, Yusuf alayhi salam has been given half the beauty. Yusuf alayhi salam has been given half the beauty. He was very, very handsome, charming and beautiful young man. So she wanted him. And he said, I fear Allah. So a person who does this and doesn't uh, take this forward, he's rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is very difficult. You know, uh, for the brothers who are listening, uh, all of you know this, it is very difficult. Very, very difficult. Number six, a man giving in charity secretly. As the hadith says, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is giving. So secretly. So you don't even think about it and you're giving charity. And this is the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Finally, a man who remembers Allah when he is alone. Okay, talking about point six again. Um, uh, okay, I'm just going more detail, detail into this hadith because it's important, right? Um, there are a lot of lessons to take from this hadith and to improve our own selves and to see if we can fall into one of these categories. If you're not already into one of these categories, inshallah, we try to do these things for the sake of Allah with sincerity so we can obtain the reward. Uh, charity always has to be done secretly. You don't even have to inform your spouse. Except scholars say, uh, because you're giving for the sake of Allah, you want Allah to know and he knows Alhamdulillah and you want the reward from Allah alone. Not to be called a generous man, to be on the front page of a newspaper, no. Right? 
uh, to have charities named after you, uh, like the Bill Gates charity or whatever. No, Muslim doesn't do a Muslim doesn't do this. Except the scholars say, except, and we have a dalil for this as well. Except in a condition wherein, uh, by giving and by showing that you're giving, it will encourage others also to give. It will encourage the others also to give, as Uthman ibn Affan radiallahu anhu did. Uh, with Rasulullah Sallallahu once in Medina. He gave charity openly, so others also immediately started giving. This is the only, only exception. But even in this case, you're giving it only for the sake of Allah. Right? The secondary purpose is that others will also be encouraged to give. But largely, majority-wise, you know, you give it very secret. And finally, the man who remembers Allah when he is alone and he sheds a tear for the sake of Allah, fearing Allah. So when we are alone, do we remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And we do we and are we scared of his punishments? Do we fear our sins? That's the point. So these are the seven categories, brothers and sisters, and all of them apply to both brothers and sisters who uh, will be given the shade of the throne of Allah on the day of judgment when there is no other shade. Number three, uh, the moment the believers who help others in dunya, what is their situation? In Muslim, Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever relieves, relieves Sorry, a believer of distress in this world, Allah will relieve him of some of the distress on the day of the day. So if you help a Muslim, he is in need, he needs a loan, he needs a, a whatever kind of help. He's distressed and you help him for the sake of Allah, Allah will inshallah remove some of our distress on the day of resurrection. Which we all need. Whoever makes things easy for those who are in difficulty, Allah will make things easy for him. In this world and in the next. Whoever conceals the faults of a Muslim in this world, Allah will conceal his faults uh, in the world and in the hereafter. Allah will help the slave so long as the slave helps his brother. So again, the key is brotherhood or sisterhood in Islam. And, and the point is that we, 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 try, we need to try to help others. Uh, concealing faults. So if you come to know a Muslim brother, your brother in Islam uh, is, for example, let's say drinking. He has a problem of drinking alcohol. Uh, he's trying to kick the habit, but you know, he knows it's wrong, but he's addicted kind of it to it. And you come to know, subhanAllah, you know, by chance or, you know, you, you just come to know this. What do you do? Do you go telling everybody Falan drinks, Falan drinks in the masjid, in, in the halakas, in the gathering, oh, I met this person, he drinks. You know this fana, oh, he drinks. No. As a Muslim, we do not expose the faults of our brothers. Unless there is a reason, and we will see that inshallah. The general rule is we conceal the faults. Because we want our sins to be concealed on the day of judgment. We all commit sins, brothers and sisters. Yes, he's, he's drinking. That's his sin. What about my sin? I may be doing something else. And subhanAllah, we Muslims are so pathetic that, you know, we only look at the sins of others and we blow them out of proportion. We publicize them, we propagate them, social media, TV, news, whatever. A Muslim is supposed to conceal sins and faults of his brother, except in three cases. One, in a, in a court uh, case, when the qadi or the judge uh, calls you and you're a witness, you speak the truth. Uh, number two, in, in, in situations of marriage. So you know this brother drinks and another brother comes to you and says, okay, you know, I want to give my daughter in marriage to this other brother. What do you think of him? You know him well, he's your friend. So I want to inquire about, inquire about him with you. What do you think? How is he? Now you need to tell this person, this father, that yes, he is good, mashallah, alhamdulillah is good, but he has a problem of drinking. And inshallah, we'll work on it or whatever, you know, but you need to tell him that he drinks. And then it's up to the father whether he wants to go ahead with it or he wants to drop it because it's a life at stake. His daughter's life is at stake. This is the second point, uh, area where you have to um, expose this fault. And the third one is when a Muslim spies. A Muslim spies uh, for the kuffar or for the munafiqoon. Uh, against his brothers. This is the third point where this fault has to be publicized. People should know that he's a spy. Barakallah fikum. 
Number four, those who are lenient in debts. We talked about this briefly in the last point as well. But uh, in Bukhari, in Muslim, Rasulullah says, Allah says, meaning of which is, a man used to lend money to people and he used to say to his servant, when you come to one who is in difficulty, let him off. Let him off. Perhaps Allah will let us off. And when he met Allah, Allah let him off. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So in this case, a man is telling a servant, that, and this man is a, is a person who lends money, that when you meet someone who is to collect the money back, and if he's in difficulty, if you see him as difficulty, forgive the loan, let him off. It's okay. Allah. How many of us do this? And we travel across the earth, we chase people to get back our money. Perhaps Allah will let us off. And Rasulullah says, Allah did let him off. And this hadith is amazing because this is something which we are talking about now, but it happened in the past. Rasulullah mentioned this many years ago in, 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 in when, when he was a prophet of Allah, when he was alive in Makkah and Medina, right? So this is a hadith which happened in the past. And it is talking about something in the future. That Allah will let him off. Allah already let him off something in the future. The day of judgment. Allah says that. Amazing, amazing. Allah amazing. Number five. A moment who is fair and just. Again, justice. Muslim, Rasulullah says, وسلم, those who are fair and just will be with Allah on thrones of light on the right hand of the most merciful. And both his hands are right hands. Those who were just in their judgments toward their families and in any matter which was entrusted to them. So this is another additional reward from this hadith for the people who are fair and just. They will be seated on thrones, not, not ordinary thrones, of thrones made of light and to the right side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rahman or Rahim. And because they were just in their judgments, like we talked about earlier, and they are fair in whatever matters which comes to them, any case which comes to them, any, any, any dispute which comes to them, they judge it with fairness, even if it is against them, even if it is against their own uh, families or children and whatever. That's the just Muslim. Number six. From the moments, the state of the situation of the believers, specifically the shuhada and the murabitun. Who? The shuhada and the murabitun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in uh, a hadith from Rasulullah that in different books of hadith, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and the Sahih, meaning of which is before Allah, the shaheed has six virtues. So this one hadith, the other hadith talking about other virtues as well. He is forgiven from the first drop of blood shed. He is forgiven. Khalas, this is his purification. Complete and total purification. Remember, remember we talked about the purification process. Khalas, the first uh, blood drop comes out, the bullet which hits him or the bomb which explodes on him and the first blood drop which comes out, all his sins are forgiven and he is purified. Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. He will be shown his place in paradise. When he is in the grave, he is shown his place, his palace in Jannah. He will be protected from the torment of the grave. He will be safe from the greatest terror on the day of judgment. A crown of dignity will be placed on his head, of which one ruby is better than this world and all that is in it. He will be married to 72 of Hur al Ain. He will intercede for 70 of his relatives. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And after reading this, who is the fool who doesn't want to be a shaheed? Rasulullah says in the hadith, meaning of which is. And for Rasulullah, it was a given. Allah promised him that his enemies can never kill him. This was a promise given to Allah to Rasulullah. But in spite of that, Rasulullah, he said, I wish I would die. As a shaheed. Come back alive and die again as a shaheed. Come back alive and again die as a shaheed. But this was not given to Rasulullah. Because he died, as we know, uh, from sickness, from a fever. Who is a shaheed here mentioned here? As we know, there are different categories of people who come 
under the general uh, broad um, category of shaheed or the shahada uh, like people who die of a stomach ailment people who um, die of plague people who died drowning in the, in the sea or a tsunami or whatever people who die because of a wall falling upon them or an earthquake and the buildings fall on them huh? uh, what else i think i'm missing something anyway it'll come inshallah so all these are categories of shaheed but this hadith is talking about the shaheed fi sabilillah in battle fighting for the sake of allah fighting for la ilaha illallah fighting for tawhid to be the most high this are the virtues which he will be given specifically these are not virtues given to the other categories no yes he is the status of shaheed but these virtues are specifically for a person who dies fighting fi sabilillah any for us you and me any one of this is alhamdulillah fantastic our day is made our life is made imagine all these six or seven aspects and uh, hural ain is basically uh, okay murabitun sorry we need to also talk about who is a, who is a murabit a person is a, is a murabit who stands in ribat what is ribat ribat is guarding the outposts of the islamic state or the muslims yeah or the community or whatever you're guarding them you're uh, staying all up all up at night or the day and and guarding them protecting them from the enemies so you're on the lookout for any movement that so that you can warn the muslims and you want to protect them and usually these are outposts these are uh, border areas where the murabit goes for ribat so he also comes under the same category in fact he has an additional advantage the murabit has an additional advantage his deeds continue to benefit him after death as you know from the hadith of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam there are only three things which benefit a muslim after his death everything else closes uh, a, a child who who prays for him uh, beneficial knowledge is left behind or any sadaqa jariya you know something he did uh, like building a well or having a cooler water cooler whatever for the muslims to drink from yeah things which like building a masjid things which will be sadaqa jariya but for a murabit his good deeds continue to benefit him they keep getting multiplied ala tul till he is resurrected is an additional exception an additional advantage for the person in ribat who are the hurul ain because a, a shaheed is given 72 or sorry is married to 72 of the hurul ain hurul ain is 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 are the are the damsels or the or the the ladies of jannah whom allah has created specifically for the humans whom no man or jinn has touched so there is these are virgins and they are mentioned in many parts of the quran as well and you, again for you and me one is enough this 72 72 so these are these are the um, the virtues of the shuhada and the murabit on the day of judgment and this is their condition on the day of judgment in tabarani which is sahih rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam guarding the borders of islam for a day is better than fasting for a lifetime allah akbar one day one day in ribat guarding the borders of islam for a day is better than fasting for a lifetime in terms of reward in terms of virtue fasting itself has great virtue as we know fasting itself is very virtuous it's like fasting for a lifetime better than that more than that whoever dies guarding the borders of islam for the sake of allah will be kept safe from the great greater terror which we talked about in the last slide his provision and breeze will be brought from paradise and the reward of the murabit will continue until allah resurrects him allahu akbar the reward of the murabit will continue until allah resurrects him so these are great rewards for the muslims who die fighting for sabilillah and for the muslims who die in ribat bordering uh, guarding the borders of islam and the islamic state also in bukhari rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam meaning of which is by the one whose hand is my soul 
And this you will see many times in a hadith, uh, this wording, by the one in whose hand is my soul. See, all our souls are in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here, Allah, Rasulullah is referring indirectly to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By the one in whose hand is my soul. No one is wounded for the sake of Allah, and Allah knows best who is wounded for his sake. But he will come on the day of resurrection with his wounds flowing with blood. The color will be of blood, but the smell will be of musk. It will look like blood, it will, uh, the color will be like blood, it will feel like blood, but the smell will be like musk. And of course, it doesn't pain the person. There is no pain uh, for him on the day of judgment. It will smell like musk. Number seven. Allahu Akbar. Those who control their anger. See, for, uh, we as Muslims, we are very angry people. Huh? Yes or no? Yani we get angry for the smallest thing. Yani. Little extra salt in the food. Khalas. Oh, the guy will take off on the husband and the wife like never before. And the poor lady thinks, why the hell did I cook? Or likewise, the children, the children with, with uh, colleagues, uh, in the masajids, people also fight in the masjid. And anger is from shaitan. Anger is from shaitan. Rasulullah said, Salah said, where is the hadith he talked about the cure for this and the preventive measures for controlling anger? In one hadith, he told a Muslim who asked him to advise him, a Sahabi, he said, advise me. He said, don't get angry. Advise me, don't get angry. Advise me, don't get angry. Three times. Another hadith, he saw two people fighting and he said, I know of a, of a statement of a kalima. If one of them says this, they will stop fighting. The Sahabi asked, what is it, Ya Rasulullah? He said, to seek refuge in Allah from shaitan. A'udhu billahi min shaitan ya rajim. Those who control their anger. And other hadith, hadith, like, you know, there are various things. Allah Rasulullah said, if you get angry, go and make wudu and come back. Because anger is from the fire of hell. Anger is from the fire of hell and water will extinguish or douse it. Go and make wudu. Better still, he said, make wudu and pray to rakat. Your anger will cool down. If you're standing when you're angry, he said, sit down. If you're sitting when you're angry, he said, lie down. These are all preventive measures to control anger. But the point is, the underlying fundamental uh, point is that do we want to control the anger? That's the point. These, these, these things will not work. Making wudu, salam, lying down, sitting down. Huh? These things will not work until we ourselves sincerely want to stop the anger. We ourselves want to prevent this situation from escalating. How many of us want to do that? We want to escalate it. We want to make a big deal out of it. We want the neighbors to hear. We want to prove a point. We want to know who is the king of the jungle. SubhanAllah. That's the point. If these, if these intentions are there in the heart, those preventive measures will not work at all. So first of all, as the anger starts creeping up, we need to know that yes, we want to control the anger. And then these things will work, inshallah. And those who can do this, those who can do this. Rasulullah says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Tirmidhi Abu Dawood, Sahib Al Al-Bani Sheikh, Rahimullah, whoever controls his anger when he is able to act upon it, Allah will call him before all of the creation on the day of resurrection and will let him choose whichever of four al ayn he wants. Yeah, brothers, yeah, shabab, khalas. What more do you want? Yalla, yalla, stop your anger from today. You will have a hura line. Isn't this what you want? The brothers at least, yeah? Hura line, it is not a, da, a, a model from dunya. It is not a heroine of this world. It is a hura line from Jannah. Khalas, this is the biggest motivation, motivation, the biggest carrot you can get. But the point is what? The condition is what? The shart is what? Whoever controls his anger when he is able to act upon it. Not when the manager, the boss, your big muri, uh, mudir, whatever, your manager, he's shouting at you. Yeah? For whatever reason. And you're angry. And you're controlling your anger. Oh, I control my anger. Oh, I'm the great guy. I can't. Come on, you can't shout back at him in any, any way. This is not controlling the anger. 
Controlling the anger is when you're able to act upon it, when you are the manager and you control your anger and you don't blast your employees. When you are the husband and you control your anger and you don't blast your wife. When you are the father and you control your anger and you don't blast your children. That's the, that's the condition. You have the capability to act upon the anger. You have the capability to make it escalate. You have the capability to grow this anger and you yet control it. That's the shark. Then you will have a hural ayn on the day of judgment. And how? In front of everybody, everybody, including your wife, she will be there. In front of everybody, Allah will call you and honor you and tell you, choose whichever hural ayn you want. Ya Allah, you choose. SubhanAllah. You can make a choice. Isn't this good enough? Yani, uh, carrot or motivation to control our angers? And some brothers, mashallah, mashallah, may Allah guide them and give them tawfiq and Allah mustaan, yani. uh, The kind of cases I come to hear, ajeeb, wallahi ajeeb. Yes, all of us get angry, even I get angry. Yani. It's not something uh, unknown or foreign to anybody, but some cases are weird. The kind of anger people have, mashallah. See, in the West, if you're in the West, you're, you're a kafir or, or even living in the West, US, UK, whatever, yeah? Excuse me. Yeah? What do they do? They send you for where? Anger management. Oh, he needs some anger management. He needs some anger management courses. He needs to see a quack. He needs to see a whatever psychologist, psychiatrist. He, he needs to control his anger. This is anger management for us. For a Muslim, this is anger management. Slide number, uh, point number seven in the screen in front of you. This is anger management. And all the preventive measures, which I, which I said, Audhu Billahi Minish Shaitan Rajeem, making wudu, making two rakat salah, sit down if you're standing, lie down when you're sitting. This is anger management defined by who? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He, he is the author of this anger management course. What better anger, anger management can you get? So Muslim doesn't have to pay, I doesn't have to pay a thousand dollars or whatever and go and attend a, a course for anger management. No. It's free. It's there in the Quran and the Sunnah. See, the point is we Muslims, we, we do not know what is in the Quran and the Sunnah. That's our problem. Everything is there. Everything the Kufar, Kufar are teaching you, already Rasulullah has taught us many years back. Everything is there. You just have to take time out have the right intention, open it, read it, and act upon it. Simple and easy. Number eight, freeing a slave. A Muslim who frees slaves. A mu'min who frees slaves. What is his situation on the day of judgment? Before that, we need to define slave. Because some people have a big misconception about this word slave. Okay? Uh, a slave is not your servant who comes to the home and cleans up for you. Because, you know, as we know, uh, the slave or the right hand positions, a man can approach this, 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 this lady, if she's a female, uh, she's a slave living in the house under the, um, under the master, he can approach her, have intercourse with her. It's allowed in Islam. But this doesn't mean you go and have intercourse with your maid servant who comes to clean the house or cooks for you or gives uh, you're given a salary. But she's not a slave. She's a maid servant. Very, very important, brothers and sisters. I get this question many times. She is not a slave. She is a servant. These are two different things. You cannot approach her. She is haram for you. She is a non-maharam. You can't, you can't, whatever. So a slave is what in Islam? A slaves in Islam traditionally are people who are taken from the enemy. This is one way of obtaining a slave. The other way is you can buy a slave. Somebody already has a slave. Abdullah already, Abdullah already has a slave. I go to Abdullah and say, I want to buy your slave. And we deal, we have a negotiation, we agree on the price, and he sells me the slave. Even in this, there are some certain conditions. If it's a female slave, I have to wait to make sure she's not pregnant because she could be carrying the, the child of Abdullah. And genealogy and, 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 and uh, lineage, lineage, sorry, lineage in Islam is very critical, very critical. So there are very various conditions, of course. But the point is generally is that 
uh, slaves can be obtained in these two manners. Either you buy a slave from, an, from a person who already owns one, or the Muslims or the Muslim army attacks a kafir country, a disbelieving country, because they didn't accept Islam and they didn't want to pay jizya. So they're attacked and they lose or they run away, whatever. So their women, men and children are slaves. The captives are treated as slaves. These are the slaves. And the, and the king or the ruler or the leader of the army, the commander of the army, it, he distributes the slaves amongst the soldiers. Right? Now, this slave is not like the slave, again, which we have these preconceived notions of uh, the black Africans and the Americans, you know, chaining them and, and, and slogging them and whipping them and flogging them and starving them. Huh? keeping them in inhuman conditions. No, no, wallahi, no. Slaves in Islam have a very high status. Rasulullah he made it a point in various hadith, in various aspects. If you make a mistake, the kafara is what? To free a slave. You're giving him his freedom. Once a slave is free, khalas, he's now a free man. He cannot be bought, he cannot be sold. He is a free man. He can also have a slave himself, if he wishes. Now he's free. Islam went to great lengths to free slaves. And Rasulullah said in a hadith to the to people who owned the slaves, he said, give them the better food and you eat the inferior food. So let's, for example, give them the biryani and you eat white rice or broth. That's the point. And a slave eats with you in Islam. How many of us eat with our servants? We eat everything and what is left over because we couldn't eat it. We couldn't manage stuffing more into our stomachs, which are already overfilled and pot bellied and everything. What do we do? Oh, we don't want to throw it. Let's give it to the servant. Ya Allah. And you expect reward from Allah? Subhanallah. Laya Sheikh. This is not how Allah rewards people. That you just throw away what you don't want to use. Or give it to the servant. Islam wants the slave. Umar bin Khattab. Wallahi, wallahi, wallahi. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu an the Khalifa of the Muslims, when he was Amir al muminin he went to, I think, uh, the Egyptian governor. I don't remember, but one of the governorates where the, the Muslims were ruling, he went to this person's house and the person was honored that, you know, the governor was honored that Amir al muminin is coming, he came and he brought him and he sat down and we discussed matters. It was time for food. So they sat around at the table and the slave, they, he brought the food and he kept it and he left. And the, the governor was starting to eat. And he said, Amir Mumin, yalla, bismillah, start eating. Umar was shocked. He said, your slave doesn't eat with you? Your servant doesn't eat with you? So the governor said, no, ya Amir Mumin, he's a slave. Umar got up. Umar did not touch the food. Umar got up. He said, wallahi, you know, you people. And he said something, I don't remember the hadith. But he made it a point to call the slave and sit and eat with them. This is Islam. This is Islam. You want to follow the Sunnah? This is the Sunnah. Start from your house. And what do we say? Oh, no, no, if you do this, you know, he will sit on our head. That's something else. Sitting on your head is between him and Allah. You do your part. See, we don't control outcomes in Islam. This is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't play Allah, audhu billah. We do our part, we do the Sunnah, and leave the rest to Allah. So I hope the picture is clear. Who is a slave and who is not a slave? Today we don't have the situation. We don't have the Muslim army going and defeating the Kuffar and taking uh, the Ghanima. No. So we don't have slaves in, in the present day situation. This is a problem. Right? So you want to, sla want to have slaves? You need to have an Islamic army under the banner of La ilaha illallah. And then uh, you attack a, uh, another uh, Kafir nation. And you take the people as hostages. These are your slaves. And some of the slaves were, were, were scholars in Islam. Tabain, Adba Tabain, they were slaves and they were scholars, scholars. Scholars of Islam. Allah Akbar. So a person who frees a slave, the Quran, Allah says, meaning of which is, but he has made no effort to pass on the path that is steep and what will make you know the path that is steep? It is freeing a nick, freeing a slave. 
the tafsir of the khatir of this ayat uh, the shaykh says whoever frees a believing slave allah will free all of his limbs from the fire because of that so he will free an arm for an arm a leg for a leg and so on allahu akbar allahu akbar so the person will not be touched by fire on the day of judgment if you free a slave allah will free our limbs from the hellfire and abu bakr siddiq traditionally he is the classical example he used to free slaves right left right and center abu bakr siddiq radiyallahu an he used to free so many slaves and most of the slaves who were freed were poor people weak people women and children he would buy a slave and free him bilal you know bilal the muaddin of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the habashi he was a slave he was a slave bilal radiyallahu an he was a slave and he was being tortured he was being tortured by his master in the hot desert of arabia abu bakr siddiq happened to pass by he told this person why are you torturing this poor man for the sake of uh, just because he says my my rabb is allah so that person the master he said it is you referring to abu bakr it is you and your people who are causing this problems you are the people making this headache of islam and everything for us so abu bakr said to him will you sell him to me you, like i said earlier slaves can be bought and sold he said will you sell him to me the person said the master said of course i am fed up with him how much do you want so for example i don't know the exact price of course now but for example let's say uh, abu bakr siddiq or the person the, the owner of the slave of bilal the master the kafir from quraish he said let's say for example 1000 dirhams for example 1000 dirhams abu bakr readily agreed and he paid him 1000 he took bilal and he said you're free he freed bilal immediate immediate on the in, on the spot so bilal didn't have to do any any work for abu bakr no uh, tilling of the farms no bringing the water nothing nothing immediately abu bakr said you're free abilal you're a free man go and only the master can free the slave the master of the kafir was shocked and he told uh, abu bakr he said you agreed immediately for the price if you had even haggled and negotiated negotiated sorry negotiated and asked for 500 instead of 1000 i would have sold him for 500 I was fed up with him. I would have sold him for half the price. But he didn't even negotiate. Allahu Akbar. You know what Abu Bakr Siddiq said? Allahu Akbar. This is why he is Abu Bakr Siddiq radiyallahu anhu. He said to the kafir. He said if you had asked me for 2000, I would have given you 2000. Allahu Akbar. He said if you had asked me for 2000, double the money, I would have given you 2000 immediately. So this is the great reward on the day of judgment for freeing a slave, building a masjid. Muslims who do this in dunya, what is the reward on the day of judgment? Rasulullah says, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam." The hadith Sahih: Whoever builds a mosque, masjid, so that Allah will be remembered therein, Allah will build for him a palace in Jannah. Whoever frees a Muslim person, that will be his ransom from hell. Whoever turns grey in Islam. that gray hair will be a light for him on the day of resurrection so building a masjid contributing towards building a masjid are all great deeds very righteous deeds in islam and we will have inshallah a jannah a palace or a palace in jannah also the last point in this hadith whoever turns gray in islam that gray hair will be light for him on the day of resurrection what does this mean we need to explain this right because many of us have gray hair Many of us who go beyond whatever, I think forty, fifty, forty, maybe forty. Yeah, these days I think it's forty. The hair turns grey. The key here is grey in Islam, not just any grey hair. You have to be a practicing Muslim. You have to be a practicing Muslim and growing old in this situation of being a practicing Muslim. Now your grey hair will be a light on the day of judgment. not otherwise barakallahu feekum finally i think this is the last point about the people of the believers and their state on the day of judgment the muaddin muaddin is the one who gives adan adan is the, the is the verb is the action and the doer of the action uh, the file is muaddin 
Muslim Rasulullah says sallallahu alaihi wasallam meaning of which is the muaddins will have the longest necks of all the people on the day of resurrection there are two points to this one long necks are considered a sign of beauty and two from the crowd from the jama on the day of judgment the hashar you can identify because of the long necks he will stick out and you will know he is a muaddin he is the one who called to call for salah In Bukhari, Rasulullah said, meaning, I see that you love sheep and the open country. When you are with your sheep or in the open country, in the countryside, and you call the adhan for the prayer, raise your voice in making the call for no jinn, human, or anything else hears the voice of the muaddin as far as it carries, but to testify for him on the day of resurrection. Allahu Akbar. There's another reward, another bonus, a double reward now. The first one is the longest next. And, and the honor on the day of judgment. The second is that Rasulullah says, even if you are in the open country, nobody is there around you. There is no jama, there is no habitation, no people, nobody will come for the jamaat. Still, you make the adhan. Still, you make the adhan. Many brothers ask me this question, you know, if I'm praying in the house, do I have to make the adhan? See, adhan is fard kifaya. It's fard kifaya. It's an obligation, but a communal obligation. So, if some people do it, it is sufficient. So if you can hear the adhan, it is sufficient. You don't have to make the adhan. But keeping this hadith in mind, keeping the second hadith in mind, if you make the adhan as well, inshallah, this is good for you, for your family and for your house, if you're praying there. Because why? No jinn or human or anything which hears your voice will testify for you on the day of judgment. So all the jinni around us, all the humans around us who hear this voice on the day of judgment, they will say, yes, oh Allah, Abdullah made this adhan. Or Fala made this adhan and Fala made this adhan. So it is something in favor of you on the day of judgment. So this is the great reward for the Muaddin on the day of judgment. Virtues of wudu. On the day of resurrection, my ummah will be called Al Gur Wal Mahajjilun Mahajjilun because of the traces of their wudu. Al Gur or Gur means white spots. White spots. And uh, muhajjalun means uh, whiteness. It's from tahjil. It means whiteness. So the people who make the wudu, not anybody, please, this is very, 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 very important. Brothers and sisters, wake up. If you've been sleeping so far, please wake up now because this is very important now. What I'm going to say is very important. Not every Muslim today or Muslima today does wudu correctly. This is a big problem, a major problem. A big error amongst the ummah. Because the wudu has to be done as Rasulullah did wudu. Because he's our prophet. So please, please, please go back and check the, check the books of Hadith, Bukhari, Muslim. There is a Bab chapter on Tahara. Bab al Tahara. There is a chapter, there is a, there is a door of a chapter on Tahara purification. And please read the hadith today, today. Please read, this is your homework. This is your homework, okay? Please read the hadith on wudu. How Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yours and my prophet, how did he make wudu? In the, in, in, the, in, in the messenger of Allah, you have the most excellent example. He is our example for everything. He is our role model for everything, including wudu. So please check the hadith, how he made wudu, and start correcting ourselves. From today, from the next salah. Because if your wudu is wrong, not, per, not as per the way of Rasulullah, your salah is not accepted. If your wudu is wrong, your salah is not accepted by Allah, no matter how much you pray. Because one of the conditions for salah is wudu, to be in tahara. Example, many of us Muslims, especially in the subcontinent, in wudu, they wipe their necks. They make masa of their necks from the back, from, with the back of the palms. They wipe their necks. This is wrong. This is a bid'ah. This is an innovation. I am not saying this. Please check the books of hadith. Rasulullah never did this. You, if you find a hadith where he did this, it is sahih, please, please send it to me. Wallahi, please send it to me. Taib, whom are you following then in making wudu? Remember, if your wudu is wrong, 
not as for the way of Rasulullah, your salah is not accepted. What is the point of praying then? It is the second pillar of Islam. Please, brothers and sisters, today go back to the books of Hadith, refer them, Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, Tirmidhi, the Sahih Hadith, check how Rasulullah made his wudu. If you do this, if you do the wudu correctly, now on the day of judgment, you will come with your, the parts of your body which were washed, these will be shining with whiteness. This is the virtue of wudu. And there is another reward for this. We'll discuss more of this when we talk about al hawd how the al kawsar al kawsar sorry, al kawsar the, the, the pond or the, or the cistern given to Rasulullah. There is another uh, advantage. But for now, this is the virtue of wudu on the day of judgment. So that was the state of the people. We talked about everybody. We completed all the kinds of categories of people. The kuffar, munafikun are included there. Um, the believers who sinned and the believers who are pious, who did not sin or sins are purified, their conditions. We gave many examples. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Number seven. I want to start this inshallah and then we'll stop for some time because we still have some while to go. Um, the intercession. We're moving on now to the intercession. Ashifa. What is this? In this part, you will learn what is intercession, what are the types of intercession, and the conditions for intercession. This is very important. There are conditions, very, very important. That we know that there are certain conditions, and only then the intercession will happen or will succeed or will be fulfilled. The dictionary definition basically, I think this is from, yeah, dictionary.com. An act or instance of interceding. Intercession, an act or instance of interceding. Or interposing or pleading on behalf of another person. Interposing or pleading on behalf of another person. Or a prayer to God on behalf of another. I mentioned God here because I just did a copy paste, copy paste from uh, dictionary.com. Obviously, God is not a good word to use, uh, but just for understanding, any a prayer to Allah on behalf of another. This is intercession. So I hope the meaning is clear now for all of us. What is intercession? Right? It is an interceding, pleading uh, on behalf of another with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. In the Sharia, it means interceding for or pleading for another person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or pleading on the behalf of another person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is intercession. Ashifa in the Arabic language. Rasulullah said sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the hadith sahih Bukhari and Muslim every prophet every prophet asked for something or every prophet was granted one supplication for his nation guaranteed but I have postponed my supplication in order to intercede for my ummah on the day of resurrection. Allahu Akbar. This is, this is a blessing for us. That our Prophet, and the least we can do to thank him is to follow him. The least we can do to thank Rasulullah for this hadith is to follow Rasulullah in his actions and his deeds and his sayings. So he says every Prophet was granted a supplication. And they all used it in dunya for their ummah. I was also granted one, Rasulullah said, Sallallahu But I did not use mine in dunya. I'm reserving it. I'm keeping it for the day of judgment in order to intercede on behalf of my ummah. Yani, wallahi, wallahi, brothers and sisters, you, based on what we have discussed so far, each one of us needs this desperately on the day of judgment. Each one of us needs this intercession desperately, desperately on the day of judgment. Never for an instance we should, as Muslims, think that we are, okay, alhamdulillah, cool, we are safe, we are going to Jannah. La. Always fear, fear your sins, fear the punishment of Allah, fear the deed itself, whether it was, whether it was done correctly, whether it was ikhlas, and so on and so forth. The hadith of Shifa, as Shifa, it's a very long hadith, 
it's there in Bukhari, Muslim, also other books of Hadith, and it is Sahih. There are various versions of it as well, various riwayat of it as well. On the Day of Judgment, I hope you can see my screen, inshallah. Time. If you cannot screen my, see my screen, please speak up. Jazakallah khair. Uh, if you cannot see, otherwise it's okay, inshallah. <laughs> I assume you can see it. Um, yesterday I had a problem. Time. So at the Hadith of Ashifa, very famous Hadith, very, very famous. It is called the Hadith of Shifa. Very long Hadith. I've kind of broken it down here in blocks. So the Day of Judgment, like we said, people are, will be getting impatient and desperate. Because they're all standing naked, uncircumcised, uh, in, uh, under the sun, sweating, drowning in their sweats, and nothing is happening. So they want the, 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 uh, the proceedings to begin. To the extent that the hadith says, they will say, Oh Allah, start the judgment, start the proceedings, even if it means going to hellfire. <laughs> they, at that point, they will not, obviously not know the intensity of hellfire and what it means. But the situation is so desperate, the situation is so impatient, that they want it to start. Whatever happens, it's okay, let's get out of this situation currently. That's the nature of, a, that, that's the nature of human beings, basically. They, th they think the grass is always greener. They think the grass is always greener. So people are getting impatient and desperate and they don't know what to do. They're looking around. Whom can we go to? Whom shall we ask to, for, to, to insert, intercede on our behalf? Shifa. They will rush to Adam salam first. Who is Adam salam? The one whom Allah created with his hand. The first of the human beings. And we are all children of Adam alayhi salam. So they will go to Adam alayhi salam and say, Oh Adam, Ya Adam, Allah created you with his own hands. Please intercede on our behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What will Adam alayhi salam say? He will say, Nafsi, Nafsi. Myself, Myself. He will fear the sin which he committed. What is the sin? Eating from the tree in Jannah, which was already forgiven for him. Subhanallah. That sin, he asked forgiveness, as we know, uh, from the Quran and the Sunnah, and Allah already forgave him. Yet he is worried about it. What about you and I? We commit sins left, right, and center, up and down. And none of this is, there is, there is no guarantee from Allah that he's forgiven these sins for us. And we are sitting as if, you know, everything is forgiven. Khalas, yalla, mashallah, yalla, hadith. Mushkila. Wallahi mushkila. So Adam alayhi salam will say, nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself. Go to Nuh alayhi salam. He will direct the people to Nuh alayhi salam. They will all rush to Nuh alayhi salam. And they will say, Ya Nuh alayhi ya, uh, ya Prophet of Allah, Nuh alayhi salam. Allah listened to your dua. Because Nuh alayhi salam made a dua against his, his people, right? And you are the first, sorry, they, he, sorry, sorry, sorry. He, they will say, uh, O Nuh alayhi salam, you were the first messenger of Allah. Nuh alayhi salam was the first messenger of Allah. See, there are prophets and messengers, but this is not the point to go into it because I want to finish this uh, slide today and let me wrap up. Uh, so Nuh alayhi salam, um, he, he will say, you are the first messenger of Allah. So please intercede on our behalf with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What will Nuh alayhi salam say? He will say the same thing. He will say, nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself. Because he will fear what, not really a sin actually, the, 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 uh, the dua which he made against his people. Because Nuh alayhi salam, he made a dua. Because none of his people followed him. The most majority of the people did not follow him. For 950 years. 950 years, he made dawa and a very small uh, percentage of his people followed him. So he asked Allah to drown and kill everybody else. And Allah accepted his dua and the flood came and the water came from the heavens and the whole population was killed, drowned as we know. So he's fearing this and he's telling the people, no, I cannot do anything for you. Go to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam is known also as what? Khalilullah. The friend of Allah. MashaAllah. Khalilullah, what a great status for Ibrahim alayhi salam. 
they will rush to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim alayhi salam will tell the same thing to them. He will say nafsi, nafsi. He will refuse to intercede. Why? And, and the people will say, oh Ibrahim, you are Khalilullah. You are the friend of Allah. Allah will listen to you. Please, 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 yeah, please. Intercede for us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibrahim alayhi salam will say nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself. And he will fear the lie which he said. Lie? Wallah, it is not even a lie if you look at it. You and me, we lie worse than this. But this is the condition. This is because this is the prophets of Allah, they fear Allah so much. Huh? This thing which he told to the king when, when he went with uh, Sarah alayhi salam, right? And the, the king wanted her. He told that she is his sister. Though she was his wife, he said, she is my sister. And he also asked her to say the same thing. So he feared this, what he committed in dunya. And we, we lie much worse than this. So he says, nafsi, nafsi. Myself, myself. Go to Isa alayhi salam. Sorry, Musa alayhi salam. Go to Musa alayhi salam. And they go to Musa. They rush to Musa alayhi salam. They say, ya Musa, you are Kali. What is Musa alayhi salam uh, uh, referred to as? Huh? Kalimullah. The, the one who, to whom Allah spoke. The one to whom Allah spoke. As we know, different instances from the story of Musa alayhi salam. So Musa alayhi salam, they will tell him, you are, you are the one to whom Allah spoke, please intercede for us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Musa alayhi salam will tell the same thing. Nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. Musa alayhi salam will also fear. Ha, subhanallah. I forget what he feared. Uh, it will come inshallah. Um, I hope one of the brothers will help me out. But I forget what, what I forget what Musa alayhi salam uh, will fear in terms of his deeds. Um, yes, yes. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah Rabbilani. Musa alayhi salam will fear the fact that he killed a person. If you know, if you know the story of Musa alayhi salam, uh, once uh, in Egypt, he sees two people arguing and, and fighting. One is, is from the people of Iran and one is from his people, Bani Israel. And he goes and, and stops them or something and, and uh, he pushes the people of uh, the, the person from the people of around. The person falls, person falls down and he dies. He dies. It was unintentional. Musa al did not go with the intention of killing the person. He just pushed him to prevent the fighting. And because Musa al was so strong, the person fell down and he died. So it was not a, 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 a homicide or an intentional uh, you know, case. Of, of, of murder. Yet Musa alayhi salam feared this. He was scared of this. I did this. How can I intercede? How can I face Allah? You see, the whole thing is, is constant. They did the small things which, which we you know, ignore and we, don't, we do much worse than this. But because of the small things, they are fearing to face Allah. What about you and me? Are we ready to face Allah? That's the point of the hadith. And he says, nafsi, nafsi, go to Isa alayhi salam. And they rush to Isa alayhi salam and they say, Ya Isa, ya, O Isa, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you without a father, as we know, from the ruh, only a mother. Please intercede for us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Isa alayhi salam will say the same thing, nafsi, nafsi. And the hadith doesn't mention what he says about his own sins. I don't know this. As far as I know and the riwayat I have studied, there is nothing mentioned in that. Allah wa He will say, nafsi, nafsi, myself, myself. And he will say, go to whom? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And now the people, the whole of humanity will rush to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And they will say, Ya Muhammad, you were the, the leader of the prophets, the last of the seal, the seal of the prophets, and the leader of the prophets. Please intercede for us with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says in the hadith, he will say, he says, I will agree. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam See the whole journey from Adam Alayhi Salaam to Nuh, to Ibrahim, to Musa Alayhi Salaam, Isa Alayhi Salaam, and finally to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will say, I will agree. And the hadith continues. He says, I will go and prostrate, make sajda, 
below the throne of Allah. And Allah will keep me in this position for, all, for as long as he, I wish, as he wishes. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Rasulullah says, in sajda, I will keep making dua and calling upon Allah with the best and the most of his names. And he says in the hadith, some, I will use some of the names which I do not know today. On the day of judgment, when he's making sajda to Allah, Allah, Rasulullah will, will call upon Allah using names of Allah which he did not know in life, in dunya. So this is a hadith, this dalil is, is the dalil that Allah has more than 99 names. Because he has revealed 99 to us, which we know. But he has more than 99 because Rasulullah said he will use names which he doesn't know today. So he will use names and using the names of Allah to call upon him is one of the great uh, manners of dua. To use his names to call upon him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he will call upon him and he will be in sajda as long as Allah wishes. And then he says in the hadith, Allah will say, Rise, Ya Muhammad. Rise, ask, and you will be given. Intercede, and you will be given the intercession. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. What a great virtue. So he will say this. And then Rasulullah will intercede for the Ummah. This is the hadith of Ashifa. Um... I think we'll stop with this, inshallah, uh, and continue next weekend. Um, we still have some of, some points on Shifa to finish, like uh, what is Shifa al-Akbar, what is Shifa al-Azhar. There are two types of Shifa. This is Shifa al-Akbar. This Shifa we talked about now on this slide is Shifa al-Akbar, the greater Shifa. There is also Shifa al-Azhar, a, a minor or lesser Shifa. We'll discuss this, inshallah, next week. We'll again go through this again next week, inshallah, as, as, as a refresher. Uh, and then the conditions of Shifa, we'll discuss that as well. And then move on to the reckoning, the Hisab and Kitab, the accountability, the asking of questions on the Day of Judgment. Right? So, uh, inshallah, we'll stop with this. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can put them in the box. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam wa barakatuhu. In today's virtual world, can an, can an infrastructure security person be considered as Murabit? Oh, mashallah. Good question. Five. Okay. So the brother is asking is things have changed. Times have changed today. We talked about the Murabitun, the one in Rubat. Who is he? The one uh, standing guard for the Muslims. The one protecting the Muslims from harm. Protecting the Muslims from harm. So the brother's question is, uh, in today's virtual world where you know cyber attacks happen people attack um, it could be uh, attackers from a kafir nation for example attacking the Muslims um, uh, their data, their information, stealing their information, stealing the Muslims money uh, so a person who is in charge of security or cyber security can he uh, when he's guarding this and preventing the kafir from attacking uh, and, and stealing the Muslims' wealth and the data and information. Will this be person? Will this person be considered a murabit? Uh, well, Allahu alam, Allahu alam. I, I think by, 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 by kisas, you can, inshallah, because it is still harming the Muslims, not necessarily killing them, but it would be uh, financial harm, maybe uh, harming, uh, stealing identity information, possibly. Uh, Allahu alam. I will check, but I think uh, it can be considered as a murabit. But the point is what? Will he die in this? See, the hadith we talked about is not only standing in, in ribat, but dying in this position, dying in this situation. Then he will have this uh, the crown of rubies and he will be asked to choose, uh, sorry, he will be given uh, the Quran ayn and so on, right? The virtues uh, were because he died in ribat. So in this situation, even if you consider it, consider it as ribat, will he die? I don't think so. Because he is sitting uh, in the virtual world. He is sitting in the comfort of his house or in the office or in an operation center, whatever, and he is monitoring that attack. So uh, he's not going to die, right? Uh, I don't think so. Not, 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 not through an attack. So the virtue is not there. But is he considered in ribat? Probably. Probably Allahu Alam. Allahu Alam. But he will not die. So that virtue will not apply here. That virtue will only apply for someone who's guarding physically and he's attacked by a, by a spear, by an arrow, by a bomb, by a bullet, AK 47, drone strike, whatever, and he dies, now the virtue is applied. Clear? Barakallah I hope it's clear, inshallah. Type. Wallahu alam.
Um, Assalamu alaikum wa barakatuh. If men have <laughs> time. Okay, I was, I was expecting this question actually. I was wondering, I want to talk about it, but I was, was hoping this question will come. I was sure this question will come. If men have hural ayin, what do women have? Common question, common question. Whenever you speak about Jannah, and we'll talk more about this inshallah when we talk about part four, Jannah and Nar. So well, if men are given this 72 hural ayin, and the person who controls his anger is asked to choose from the hural ayin, what about women? Simple answer, simple answer. The answer is what? As far as Jannah is considered, as far as your deeds are considered, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not leave anybody shortchanged. He will not deprive anybody of his desires or her desires. Ask a man today. Ask your husband. Ask your father. Ask your son. What is it that you want the most? He wants wives. Maybe more than one wife. This is why the wives go crazy when you want to marry again, right? So he wants more than one wife. This, this is his desire. This is how a man is created. This is why he will have the whole line. What about the sisters? You ask a sister today. You ask your wife. You ask your daughter. You ask your whatever. Sister, do you want another man? She will say, are you crazy? She will say, are you crazy? And a woman will go to great lengths, and the, and the sisters can, can valid, validate this. A woman, a sister will go to great lengths to keep her husband. She will do anything. And sisters are very strong. Believe me, mashallah, wallah, Allah barik, uh, they are very strong. And they will do anything. They will go to the end of the earth to keep their husband. They want only one man. They want only one man. This is how the women has been created. This is how Allah has created the sisters. And he will give them what they desire in Jannah. Don't worry, inshallah. In Jannah, Jannah is a place where nobody will have any ill feelings. Nobody will have any issues, no anger, nothing. You will get everybody, men and women, the Muslima, Muslims and the Muslimat will get everything what they desire. And in dunya, like we said, a man wants multiple wives. This is why he's been given up to four. Up to four. And on the day of judgment, he will have her line because this is how he's created. And for a sister, she wants only one man. That's why she, that's why she, will, she will kill, she will prevent the husband from marrying again, taking a second wife because she wants to keep, she's possessive. She wants to keep the man to herself. And she will get what she wants in the day of judgment. Don't worry. Now, will she be married to her same husband on the day of judgment? We'll talk about this, inshallah, whether the sister will have the husband of dunya in the day of judgment in Jannah. We'll discuss this when we come to part four. Inshallah, hang on to that because it's not part of the current uh, sessions. So we'll discuss this. I hope it's clear. Barakallahu feekum. Allahu alam. Taib. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Wa barakatuhu. For a martyr, Jannati, how is the experience different in the grave and on the day of judgment? Okay, the question is for a martyr or for a shaheed, uh, how is the experience in the grave uh, different and on the day of judgment? We discussed this, brother or sister. Uh, when we talked about uh, death, death and barzakh. Uh, but briefly, again, uh, the, the, the martyr, the shaheed, like we said, uh, he, he has many virtues. Fee sabilillah. We're talking about fee sabilillah here. Uh, the first is that his sins are forgiven with the first drop of blood. Secondly, he will not go through sakarat al mouth. For him, the sakra, he will go through sakarat al mouth, but the sakarat al mouth will be as small and as simple, the stupor of death, as the shining of the swords uh, above his head as the hadith, or in today's case, as a bullet approaching him, for example. This is his minor sakratul mouth. Very small, very brief, temporarily. Stupor of death. And then in the grave, in the grave, he is not, uh, because he's already forgiven, forgiven, his sins are forgiven, right? Uh, and before the grave, before the grave, he is not, as a shaheed, he will not be done, uh, washed, the ghusl. Ghusl will, will not be done for him, and there is no janaza, salatul janaza for him. Why? You're not praying salat Yes, there is no jana, salat al-janazah. Why? Because in the eyes of Allah, he is still alive. His soul is in the hearts of green birds. The other people's souls are in Sijin or Illiin, as we discussed. But the souls of the, of the martyrs, shuhada, they are in the hearts of green birds roaming around Jannah wherever they wish, as we speak. Eating from anything in Jannah, no problem. No, no holes barred, no check posts, no barricades. And they can fly anywhere they wish to all the levels of Jannah. And the grave is spacious for him and all the, the blessings of the grave are there. There is no torture in the grave for him, nothing like this, inshallah. These are the virtues of a shaheed in the grave. And on the Day of Judgment, we talked about it already today uh, in terms of uh, the 72 Qur'an, 
the Shufada and Murabi Tun, we discussed this already in the slide. Please go back to the recording if you missed it. Jazakumullah khairan, wallahu alam. I hope that's clear, inshallah. Uh, women are not included in this ga in this guarding. No, it's for men. Reward Murabit. Time. Okay. The question is that uh, are sisters included in this Murabi Tun category? Usually, no, because men are the ones who go for ribat. It's a very dangerous job. Uh, sisters usually would not uh, enlist for this or take part in this, but would rather, um, I'm talking about the time of Rasulullah, the period, period of the Khulafa Rashidun and so on. They would rather take care of the so-called hospitals and clinics they had in those days. The sisters would tend to the injured, uh, nurse them, uh, take care of them, uh, food and so on and so forth. Uh, they would not actually take part in battle. Though they were exceptions. They were exceptions of some brave Sahabiyat who actually fought with Rasulullah including Battle of Uhud. Including Battle of Uhud. But these are exceptions. So, generally, no. Ribat, no. But if there is a sister, for whatever circumstance, you know, we're talking about situations which are extreme and a sister, a Muslima, goes for Ribat because there is no other man. And subhanAllah, you know, the point to see this brings a very interesting point, actually. I'm sorry to keep you so long, but uh, this is one simple point I want to make. <sighs> around the world today, around the world today, we see these issues with Muslims. And subhanAllah, we see the sisters taking to the streets, be it in India, NRC, CA, whatever, be it somewhere else, Kashmir, be it Palestine, be it uh, Sham. The sisters are coming out on the streets. Why? Where are the men? What the hell are the men doing? This is, a, this is a result of the men sleeping and wearing bangles and sitting in the houses watching TV. That the sisters are forced to come out. Our sisters are not supposed to be coming out. Our sisters are supposed to be protected at home, not coming out on the streets and shouting and, 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 and joining others and, and making the, the banners. SubhanAllah. What the hell are the men doing? This is not the job of the sisters. Wallahi, I'm sorry I'm shouting, but this is ajeeb, amazing. This never happened in history. The men of the Ummah today are sleeping. They are in deep coma. Deep coma. They are on oxygen ventilators. Wallahi. There was a sister not supposed to come out. Including Ribat. But, 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 extreme situation. Let's say the men of the people are dead or the men are not there or the men are away on battle or something and there's an army danger attacking the house, attacking the, uh, the town. And the sister is forced to go out, inshallah, she will get the same reward, of course. She will get the same reward, wallahu ala. But the point is, she should not be going out in the first place. This is not her job. Her brother, her father, her son should be going out on ribat. You get the point? Jazakumullah khair, and I hope it's clear. Uh, wallahu ala. Taib, I think we have done with the questions. I don't see any hands raised either. So, inshallah, jazakumullah khair. Uh, this is all we had for uh, today. Uh, we'll meet you again next Yom al Juma, Friday, 4.15. Please, it's 4.15. It's not 4.30. 4.15 p.m. Uh, KSA time, Saudi time, Arabian Standard time, whatever. 4.15 p.m. Until then, subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashahadu wa illa anta astakfaratu bi ilayk. Wa akhirat da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.